remember that narcissists are actually deep down way more afraid of you than you are of them. They really do. Part of the whole thing with the love bombing and the conditioning and that and, and getting you locked in and all of that is because they're actually they, they, they're afraid. They want you to be under their purview of control because they they're actually very fearful people. They don't mm. they want to lock you down because they're afraid that you're going to abandon them. They're afraid that you're actually going to figure out that they they're actually not as uh, amazing as you might, you know, think that they are or as smart as you might realize, you know, all of those things. Right. So the, the, the thing that you need to realize is that you can actually turn this around. You can actually be more powerful. <laughs> Welcome my guest, Rebecca Zung. She is one of the top 1% of attorneys in the nation, having been recognized by US News and World Report as the best lawyer in America, as legal elite by Trend Magazine, and recognized by her peers in the judiciary as AV preeminent rated in family law the highest possible rating for an attorney. She went from being a single mom, college dropout, to becoming one of the most powerful lawyers in the country at the helm of multi-million dollar practice. She is now committed to sharing her secrets and empowering others to live their best lives at their optimum level of success professionally and personally. She is the author of the best-selling book, Negotiate Like You Matter, The Surefire Way Method to Step Up and Win, and Breaking Free, a step-by-step -step divorce guide for achieving emotional, physical, and spiritual freedom. And also soon to be releasing is her newest book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. She is continuing to serve through her incredible on-demand programs such as Slay, Your Negotiation with the Narcissist, and the Divorce, Delete, Alt Control Masterclasses. She is also the host of the popular show, Negotiate Your Best Life, which is available on YouTube and as a top podcast and also a frequent keynote speaker. Okay, I am just so honored to welcome on the show Rebecca Zung. I first of all want to just honor her. She is just absolutely incredible. And I'm so happy that I was able to connect in person and get to know you more. And the topic we're going to talk about, I have yet to have specifically on the podcast, and you are definitely the most knowledgeable in this area, the topic we're going to go into. And also you're the top 1% attorney in America. But the best part about this is just getting to know you more personally. I'm just happy to share this space with you, but I want everybody else to get to know you more. So welcome to the show, Rebecca. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be with you. You're such a light. Thank you. Appreciate it. Same likewise. So I want to give a little context to the listeners to get familiar with you and where you came from and really what brought you into the topic of negotiating with a narcissist. So we're going to go deep in that conversation, but I want to give them some context of where that even came about. Oh, well, it came about, I mean, it, it, you know, naturally people would think that it came about because I practiced law for, you know, 20 years and was in the high net worth divorce space and obviously had a lot of narcissists in that world. But it really came about because I merged my practice with two other guys a, a few years ago and because really I was an entrepreneur at heart and I wanted to do more entrepreneurial things. And you know, so I went in a lot of entrepreneurial directions at that point. And in one of those entrepreneurial endeavors, I ended up partnering with somebody who ended up to be a covert narcissist. And that was really where I, I, I was just, I didn't know 
that the person was a covert narcissist. I never knew that word. I didn't know that term. And I didn't really even know that a woman could be a narcissist. I, I mean, to me, a narcissist was sort of a male, misogynist, below heart, you know, fill the room, demanding kind of person. You, you know, the word narcissist really didn't come into existence for me, at least, and, you know, a lot until like the last few years. And, you know, even in the divorce world, it wasn't something that you heard people even throwing around until the last few years. And so, you know, it wasn't something that I used a lot in, in my vernacular either. And so I, this person was a covert narcissist. And, and so I just knew that it was like bringing up feelings for me that were, uh, you know, reminiscent of when I was bullied as a kid. And I just felt very traumatized and, very confused and it caused a lot of anxiety in me. And when somebody said to me, oh, she's a covert narcissist, I was like, okay, what is that? And that's when I started studying narcissism. And I had already become an expert in the area of negotiation. That's mm -hmm. really how I built my practice. And, um, that's when I started realizing, oh, wait a minute, I can actually apply what I'm learning about narcissism to what I already know about negotiation. And that's kind of how this all evolved. Okay. So as you were talking about, you had no idea, really the concept of a narcissist, or at least you had an idea. So can we explain, because you say covert narcissist. So can you explain what a covert narcissist is, or even maybe explaining just for those that don't know specifically, I, I know we all have experienced narcissist people in our life, but to explain what are the characteristics of a narcissist and what is a covert narcissist? Yeah. So a narcissist in general, and, and, and just so people know, it really is a sliding scale. It, it is, a, you know, something that, you know, in some ways, kind of all of us kind of have narcissistic you know, qualities at times, you know, um, and, but we're talking, you know, narcissistic personality disorder is when you're kind of all the way at the end of the spectrum. Um, and it is actually a legitimate personality disorder. It is actually something mm -hmm. that is measurable and something that, um, you know, uh, is on the DSM-5 that, psychologists and psychiatrists actually do recognize as a nurse, as a personality disorder. But as you get further and further and closer and closer to that personality disorder, obviously there are people that are more and more, have more and more of these traits or tendencies, right? But yeah. basically it's a person who has, um, I like to describe it in lay person in terms, right? Which is a person who is extremely, extremely feels empty inside, has like no feeling of internal value. So they have to get all of their value from external sources. So, and, and it's like an emptiness inside of them that can never be filled. It's almost like a sieve, like that goes directly through them. So they need endless amounts of, of, you know, getting their, what we call supply from external sources. And, you know, I, I call it like diamond level supply or coal level supply because diamond level supply is what I call like the good stuff, you know, like adulation or prestige or the things that you would think of as, you know, what narcissists want, right? Building up that ego. But there's also what I call the coal level, which is like the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply, which is degrading people and controlling people mm. and manipulating people. And, you know, they, they certainly get supply from that as well. So they want both and they go after both for sure. Um, but it's, it's anything that feeds their ego. It's that external, 
you know, anything that they can get to make themselves feel better. So it's adulation, prestige, impressive friends, money, you know, all of that, but it's also treating people poorly, manipulating people, you know, that sort of thing as well. Yeah. So I know a lot of people are probably listening and thinking like, I've experienced that. I know somebody that has been in my life like that. But I'm curious, since you did say it's a personality disorder, especially on the far spectrum of it, would you say that most narcissism comes from upbringing and just that low self-esteem and that need for external validation? And then I, to my knowledge, and maybe this is not true, personality disorders actually stem from usually childhood trauma, where they have to become something else to like, they kind of step outside themselves to basically protect that child like person inside. Is that true? Yes. In, the in narcissism. Fact, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but, that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yes. So in fact, I just uh, finished writing my new book, uh, which is coming out this year. So oh, it's um, Slay the Bully, How to um, Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win is my new book that's coming out this year. And I just finished doing all the research for it. And in fact, it is due to childhood trauma, as you um, suggested. And um, so what happens is, you know, even as adults, when we experience trauma or we are in, you know, ex um, exposed to, you know, fight or flight, and we go into that, you know, um, mode, our brains dump a bunch of chemicals into our, you know, our brains. So, you know, if, if we feel like we are, um, you know, about to experience some kind of, of, um, fear or, or trauma, we, you know, we, um, our, our brains dump cortisol, epinephrine, all of that into, you know, so that we can be, um, we can, uh, run faster or, or be stronger or, or whatever it is. Right. But if, if that happens to us on a regular basis, then our brains actually become damaged. It actually, you know, is um, something that is harmful. And so and even as adults. And so when children who are constantly dealing with this and it happens to them on a regular basis have to be feeling like they're in survival mode, on a regular mm -hmm. basis, then, you know, their brains actually become, they, they, you know, it's arrested development um, in the limbic system part of their brain. And so what happens with narcissists is that as they grow older, they are actually emotionally stunted. And so mm -hmm. when they are presented with certain stimuli as they get older, they actually then, you know, feel that they are, have to go back into survival mode. And so that narcissistic injury then is, you know, uh, um, activated. And, yeah. and then they, you know, feel like they have to, you know, um, react in some way. And that, that reaction can be, you know, a number of different things, but sometimes it's rage or sometimes it's, you know, a tantrum or sometimes it's, you know, it, but whatever it is, it's because they feel like they are in survival mode. And that's mm -hmm. why they don't have empathy because, you know, to them, the way the world is, is they are in survival mode. You know, they, it's, it's, it's every man for themselves or every woman for themselves. It's, it's just, it's almost like I have to eat. And if I don't eat, then, you know, I don't get. Right. You know, it's, it's so interesting because if, if there's parents out there that are possibly maybe noticing that with their, their kids or teenagers kind of having those narcissistic behaviors, what would you suggest for the parents to do to maybe, because 
you don't want something to become a full fledged narcissistic personality disorder. And I know there's a spectrum. So how does a parent possibly make sure that they don't go down that path? Well, you know, you want your child to feel safe. You want your child to feel like they are loved. You want your child to feel like, and by the way, one of the ways that your child does become narcissistic is if they are um, overly indulged. Mm. I mean, that is another um, issue. You know, children need a certain um, amount of boundaries, you know, mm-hmm. to feel safe as well. I, I know it seems kind of counterintuitive, but you know, the bottom line is that children need to feel safety. They need to feel like they're not in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's what causes children to feel like they're, you know, you know, where that, that cortisol gets activated or that, that epinephrine gets activated where they're in that survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. That it's so good to talk about that because I, you know, besides us adults dealing with other narcissists, it's good to recognize if that is possibly being like manifesting in their children, you know, in their teenagers lives, just from all the things they deal with. So that's great. I love to talk about that. So in regards to dealing with a narcissist, what are some like immediate red flags we should look for and what should we do in the case that we are dealing directly with a narcissist, whether it be in, because I think this applies to everything, business, relationships, any interactions, what is like the immediate red flags? And then what should we do? (laughs) Yeah. So the immediate red flags are, you know, when they're, they want to rush a relationship. You know, I mean, when you start to see somebody who is, I can say love bombing, you know, I, I, I always find that that term is so interesting because it has nothing to do with love. It's always like manipulation, but it's even that way in a business relationship as well. But they want to get to the next level as fast as possible. You know, so it's, they sweep you off your feet. They're super charming, super charismatic, the the most amazing person you've ever met. They think they make you feel like you're the most incredible human. But even if it's a business relationship, and that's how it was with me, you know, they immediately want to get to step two as quickly as possible. You know, why wait? You know, we've we're we're soulmates or we, you know, have all the right contacts or, you know, everything is perfect. So why should we wait? Let's lock it in. Let's get moving. You know, so they want to get you hooked in, locked in as quickly as possible because they have invested in you. So they want to start making the withdrawals as quickly as possible. And then as soon as they have you locked in, they start devaluing you as quickly as possible. And and that and right away you start to see red flags. The stories aren't adding up, or they're mm-hmm. lying to you, or they are ghosting you. You know, as quickly as they were emailing you or texting you fifty thousand times a day, now when you're texting them, they're not writing you back, or suddenly you're so needy, or suddenly, you know, what what's wrong with you? I have to work you know, or I never said that. I never said I was going to do that, you know, um, things like that. It's, it's so brings back my past. (laughs) It brings back a past relationship. I was stuck in for a little bit, a dynamic that I was in for about four years. And, uh, and I, I feel he was like kind of on, on the spectrum of being a narcissist, but then he would like sway back and whatnot. But I experienced certain things that exactly a lot of the things you mentioned. And it's like, you get so hooked. You, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. and I'm curious, like how many people have experienced that where you, you're like, there's something that always draws you back. Well, because then they, 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 they don't stay that way. It's, it's never, 
Um, it's never all bad or all good. You know, I actually, I just changed up the opening of my, my talk. Um, actually when I was at Amberly's event and, you know, I started off with, um, oh my God, I know we just met, but you are amazing. I, I, I'm pretty sure that we're soulmates, you know, like I just, I, I was talking like that. And, and then, you know, I went right into, you know, I think that we should be in business together too, you know, because we, we're so perfect together. And then, Hey, Hey babe, can you cover my rent this month? Uh, you know, I, I have this huge commission coming in, you know, we're, we're moving in together anyway, you know, so, you know, I'm good for it. And then, you, and then I went into, I never said I was going to pay you back for that. Why, why are you saying that? I, that conversation never took place. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's just forget that conversation. I mean, come on, we're, 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 we're going to get married, you know, Let, let's not bring bad feelings into this, you know? I mean, like, it, it's like that, right? It's I very mean, manipulative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how was the best way to, so I know you, you talk about, as you mentioned, how to negotiate with a narcissist, which I want to get into that, but maybe if you could touch on like how, how to deal with those interactions for anybody that's listening to this, obviously wants to know, like, how do I deal with a narcissist in all areas of my life if I ever encounter one? Um, and it's again, not saying that they're a bad person. I want to be clear with that. At least I don't personally believe that. I just think it's like we were kind of touching on, it's possibly certain trauma or certain response that they haven't yet addressed. And so it's almost like a wound that they haven't quite healed. And they just like, it's just spew spewing on everybody you know so how do we deal hurt, with that hurt, hurt people hurt people right but yeah that it's, mean that you should put yourself in the line of fire a hundred percent so how do we remove ourselves from dealing with a narcissist or the best way to deal with a narcissist what would be that interaction per se yeah so i always say step one don't run step two make a u-turn step three break free you know, so, and I, and, and then in using my slay methodology as well. So strategy, leverage, anticipate and focus on you. So remember that narcissists are actually deep down way more afraid of you than you are of them. They really do. Part of the whole thing with the love bombing and the conditioning and that, and, and getting you locked in and all of that is because they're actually they, they, they're afraid. They want you to be under their purview of control because they, they're actually very fearful people. They don't, mm. they want to lock you down because they're afraid that you're going to abandon them. They're afraid that you're actually going to figure out that they, they're actually not as uh, amazing as you might you know, think that they are, or as smart as you might realize, you know, all of those things, right? So the, the, the thing that you need to realize is that you can actually turn this around. You can actually be more powerful. The, the minute that you start becoming the powerful version of yourself, having that respect for yourself, being the person that you were meant to be, being the highest, most amazing version of yourself that the universe and God created you to be, that's when the narcissist is going to be like, oh my God, they've figured it out and will actually not not even want to be around you anymore for, to, to be honest, because they're going to slither on to somebody else that they can actually control. And, but the point, and you're going to actually be the most incredible ver version of yourself. But, you know, if you actually have to negotiate with them, then there's going to be ways that you have to do that and ways that you have to create leverage in order to get out of this particular situation. But, you know, you, you have to 
create leverage in a certain way. And, you know, I talk about you will have to use that diamond level su supply versus that coal level supply and think about that because, you know, the strategy is first create your vision, create your vision, know what it is that you want. Be mm -hmm. very, very clear about that. Keep your eye on that prize. And then your leverage will be figuring out what form of supply is going to be more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from jerking you around. Mm. Because, you know, jerking you around is that coal level supply and you're going to have to threaten that diamond level supply. So how do you do that in your leverage? That's, that's part of your strategy anticipating that's the a knowing that they're going to try to bait you knowing what they're going to try to do so you know there are ways and tactics that you can get what you want from them by you know maybe making it their idea what they come up with you know because if you kind of plant seeds for example so that they kind of come up with what the final offer is or something like that. Because if it's your idea, then they probably won't go for it. You know, mm -hmm. some, maybe that's one of the tactics, you know, or strategies. Um, you know, another one is, I call it fluff for favor, vomit later, you know, which is, fluffing up their ego so that you get a little something that you want in return, you know, and you have to vomit later. That's fine. But, you know, it's like tactics like that, you know, but you have to remember who it is that you're dealing with. Right. Mm. And then focusing on you is the why, which is you being on the offensive and then your, your mindset. You have to believe you're going to win. A hundred percent of winning is, you know, you believing that you're going to be able to win. If you, so many times when I'm dealing with people, they're like, everyone's going to believe their lies. I can never win against a narcissist. Oh, you can't bother. Narcissists always win anyway. You know, if you have that mentality, you definitely never going to win. Right. So. Yeah. That's the slay methodology. So, you know, first thing is definitely boundaries, you know, having boundaries, not allowing them to speak to you in a, in a disrespectful way. You, you know, I, I always say there's certain things that are negotiable. There's certain things that aren't. What's negotiable? Issues, terms in a contract, things like that. What's not negotiable? Your self-respect. Yeah. who you are. So as soon as they start, you know, raising their voice, calling you names, making it personal, you don't have to sit in the room. You don't have to allow them to speak to you that way. You can just say, we can continue this conversation when you are, you know, less emotional, or you can observe their behavior to them. I can see that you're upset. We can talk later you know, th things like that, um, you know, just start learning how to take yourself out of it, mm. you know, never become emotional. Don't ever defend yourself. Never defend yourself. Because when you defend yourself, you're actually giving them credence, you know. So those are just a few things that you can do. So helpful, but it's also so overwhelming because just when you're describing all this, the things I'm, I'm thinking of in one bucket, a relationship, and I'm thinking the other bucket, a business partnership or, or whatnot. And it's almost like the most important thing is holding your worth, like being very strong and found and your foundation is so sturdy that you are able to kind of manage their behavior, if you want to say, and also to help hold those healthy boundaries is so key. But also just knowing like you're dealing with something that's difficult, that is all driven by their ego. So it, it's almost like a, a micromanagement type of situation. But I think the key of this is really 
anybody on the receiving end or dealing with a narcissist. It's like really checking in with yourself. Are you holding those healthy boundaries? Do you have a solid foundation of worth? Because I believe most narcissists are attracted to empathetic, compassionate people. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, they're attracted to somebody who's, um, you know, they, they almost can spot when you have kind of your own core wounds in a lot of ways, you know, like is you have that, um, that need to, uh, I will take care of you. I will love you. I will heal you. I will be the one to, um, you know, give you everything you need and, you know, um, and, and, and so what happens is, you know, you end up feeling totally and utterly depleted and yet they're still starving and needy and, and yet there's, a, and not only that, but resentful of you for not giving them enough mm. and you're in, and, and it's, it's a never ending cycle. It's a never ending cycle. Yeah. What would you say is the hardest reason that people that are in a relationship with a narcissist, what is like the hardest reason they, or what is the one reason that usually keeps them stuck in that relationship and not ever able to leave it? And maybe, maybe not in all cases, do they need to leave it? Or would you say that most likely you should not be with a narcissist? I mean, I think honestly, it's probably codependence. It's a trauma bond you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to break. It's very Mm. difficult to break, you know, and, you know, I would just say, go easy on yourself and no judgment on yourself. And don't, don't feel guilty for decisions that you've made when you're in survival mode, you know, I mean, because you, you make decisions for yourself when you, you know, because they say all the right things, you know, you, they, they draw you in by saying all the right things, everything you want to hear, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they know exactly how to bring you in they know how to do it. They're very, very cunning. And so, oh, so true. <laughs> you know, I just remember, I, I'm just like, I'm smiling on this end because I'm like, oh, I so remember this. It's so true. It's like they, they know the words, they, they know how to pull you in per se. And so it's, it's very manipulative per se. And sometimes, or, or I don't know. I think they are conscious when they're doing it. Actually, I was going to say maybe they're not oh, conscious, but I think 100%. they are. Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah. and they and it's this push pull thing. You know, they push you away, and then just as you're ready to go, they pull you back in. They know exactly what to do to bring you right back. And it's it's very um, uh, maniacal. I, I mean, it's horrible you know? And so, um, I, I would just say, you know, to anybody who's out there to just forgive yourself, you know, and be, and, and be gentle with yourself and, you know, get a support system in place for sure. You know, that's why I have a lot of the resources that I have, you know, I mean, my Facebook group has like 120,000 people in it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, so, so Rebecca, what, what you've built in a very short period of time, when you started talking about how to negotiate with a narcissist, you built your business very rapidly, especially on YouTube and your videos, you went viral and you have several books out. You have another book coming out. Why do you think so many have been attracted to this topic? It's kind of interesting to me because that 
that shows me that obviously a lot of people are dealing with narcissists and they're very curious. How do I deal with this? Because it's a, it's a behavior that I'm like, ah, losing my mind over. Is that right? Is it just people are like the people that are attracted to your content? What would you say the camp they live in? Like, is it mostly people in law or is it people in all walks of life? Oh, it's definitely all walks of life. I mean, I would say, you know, they estimate that it's like 15% of the population are either narcissistic, you know, either have narcissistic traits or tendencies or have some other kind of personality disorder that lacks empathy. Uh, And, you know, and they say if each one of those people emotionally abuses just three people in their lifetimes, then that ends up being 158 million Americans or 3.4 billion on the planet. I mean, that's like half of us, right? So that's a lot of people. And, you know, and I'm one of the few attorneys that's actually offering how to negotiate. So, you know, how to actually deal with how to actually, you know, real resources on how to deal with them. So I think that's partially why my content has really gone viral, you know? So I think that a lot of people are in pain and, and very, very hungry for how to negotiate with them. But, you know, I would say the, I I always say that, you know, one of the first negotiations that you have to do is with your own self in the morning for your Mm. own self-worth, you know? So, I mean, I know that it is for myself sometimes, you know, you know, do your own check. I, I always joke that I have to, you know, like, um, that my thoughts aren't allowed to go unsupervised, you know? And so what are some of your self-care practices? Like when you were dealing with the narcissist that you were dealing with when you were uh, in this business uh, partnership, what were some of the things when you started becoming more aware of a narcissist, when you started going down the rabbit hole of learning about it, how did you take care of yourself in the process and remove yourself from that situation? I, well, I mean, I really realized when I was dealing with that, that every moment that I gave to thinking about her and that business partnership, I was allowing myself to be a victim. Mm. And every moment that I chose to pivot, then I was in creation mode and not in victim mode. And so I just like, was like, I'm not giving myself that, uh, you know, every moment I was like, oh, she's doing this to me. I, re- I was like, oh, victim mode. Nope. I'm going to pivot. I'm working on my book, you know? So I just was like, I'm not, I'm not allowing myself that. Um, and so, you know, that's how I did it for me. You know, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm going to listen to a YouTube video. I'm going to listen to, you know, this audio book, I'm going to listen to, you know, you know, I just forced myself to make sure that if I, my, my thoughts were idle, you know, whether it's I'm walking the dog, I'm putting my makeup on in the morning. I'm, you know, at times where that's where my thoughts would be allowed to be, you know, running amok. You know, I I always say then they they go right straight to the ghetto or whatever, a bad neighborhood, you know, (laughs) then I pull them back to a place where they're not, you know, it's a much better place. I love that you when I uh, you mentioned that if you are somebody that has dealt with one or dealing with one, the first thing you said is forgive yourself, like give yourself grace. And I think that's so important because I know that was one thing I had to work on is like forgiving myself for being in this situation, allowing myself to be in this situation, meaning like, you know, I choose I chose to be there, but now I'm forgiving myself like that doesn't have to be what I'm carrying forward with me. And I think that's important for people to here is like, give yourself grace that you didn't know what you didn't know. And now you, now that you are conscious and aware of what you're possibly dealing with, now you can make a different choice and, you know, lead yourself down a different path and you don't have to carry that weight with you. I think that's so important. So I love that you mentioned that. 
and uh, let's say somebody has somebody special in their life and it could be a partner. It could be somebody in their, their family or their teenager or whatnot. And they know, I'm trying to think how to ask this question. They love them. They want them to have a better life and have quality relationships and cultivate that. But their behavior is obviously leaning towards narcissism and whatnot. How does that person help that other person get help? Because it's, I don't know if narcissists are available to really be told that they're a narcissist. (laughs) So how do you address that? If you want to help somebody you love to get help and what would that help be? I assume therapy. Well, first of all, you're not going to help a narcissist get help. I just, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, they're not self aware. And so you're not going to help them. But, you know, to help a person who's in the relationship, that's a tough one because, you know, a lot of times they're going to, it, it really depends on whether or not they're ready to recognize mm-hmm. that the person that they love is, you know, so a lot of times they're, they're, they may still be at a place that they're either defending the other person or defending the fact that they are in that relationship. You know, um, I think a lot of times people might recognize that they're in a, uh, dysfunctional relationship, but they're like, you know, I know he's not great, but he also had a traumatic childhood or he's going through a lot at work or he's, you know, he doesn't mean what he's doing. You know, a lot of times they make, um, excuses for them Mm -hmm. and, um, they're just not ready to um to go there and so it may not be well received right so you have to be careful so really what it comes down to if a narcissist is self-aware and wanting to change their behavior and they realize they're hurting people around them where they start to develop some sense of self if you want to say then they could get the help some help themselves but Usually it's not an outside source that's going to be able to help them. That's what it sounds like, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 So crazy. So out of curiosity, do you ever get sick of talking about narcissists? Because, I mean, you are so good. You've done so many interviews, so many talks, and you're obviously helping so many people. But like, do you, obviously, because this was a personal experience, you as well were in a part of, do you ever get sick of the conversation about talking about narcissists? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because when I first started down this road of being on YouTube and everything, I wanted to just talk about negotiation. Mm -hmm. And so my early videos were on negotiate, uh, negotiation and like how to get a pay raise and, you know, clothing color, psychology, negotiation, you know, and things like that. And, um, I, you know, like really my passion is, you know, like how to help people achieve like the highest version of themselves and, you know, really how to, you know, understand that your thoughts create your reality. And is, you know, I know that I've, I've really, um, understood that myself. And, and, um, you know, I really try to, to apply that in my own life. Um, but, and and I, you know, I kind of fought it in a lot of ways. I mean, I remember even when like my first videos were like, okay, the narcissist, the negotiating with the narcissist was like, these are the ones that are going viral. And I, I, and you know, I even said to my husband, I don't know if I want to be the narcissism queen, you know? And, but then I started to get a lot and I still do. Oh my gosh. Daily, daily. Uh, emails and and DMs and constant messages and notes of from people who, I mean, so moving mm. of 
my how my work has literally saved their lives. You know, I was going to commit suicide and I didn't because of you. I mean, you don't know wow. how much your work has impacted my life. I I left a an abusive marriage because of you. I uh, you know, you've helped millions of people and I mean, I literally um I got one like last week this woman was going on and on about how she won in court and her father had just died and she literally drove to the cemetery and celebrated with him wow based on using my sleigh program and didn't start crying until she sat at the cemetery and celebrated with her father who died during the case and wow i mean i cried reading the email wow and i thought that's why I do what I do now. And so uh, every single day I talk to my team because I have, you know, all of these VAs now and I have my chief operating officer who you met and, um, you know, I work with my son and, you know, we have a, a, a good sized team now. And every day I we go, our work is saving lives, our work impacts lives, our work is, you know, because they see the messages. That's and, remarkable. And that's why I, I think this is really a crusade. I mean, I, I, I cannot not do what I do now. It's so beautiful. And thank you for that. And I, I see you share such valuable content and I can see how it's helping, especially people, because you feel so much a victim in the situ situation that you just don't know what to do. And so you're giving them the resources. And so let's talk about your resources. I'm so happy that you have a book, another new book coming out. Uh, I believe it's October. Am I correct? October. Okay. And uh, Chris Voss actually wrote the foreword. So I'm super excited about that. And, awesome. you know, so yeah, and it's called Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. And you can go to slaythebully.com and check out all of the incredible bonuses that you can get by pre-ordering it, in, including early access to the manuscript. You, I mean, it's like $400 worth of bonuses. So you can get awesome. a masterclass, a workbook, all kinds of really cool things, things. by pre-ordering it. So I'm super excited about it because I just know that it's going to help so many people. So mm. I'm really, really excited about it. There's nothing else like it out there. Nothing. So. Amazing. I'm so excited. Of course, that will be in the show notes for everybody to grab. And also, I, I really encourage anybody that's listening to this right now that share this. If you feel anybody is is dealing with this in any way, manner, whether it be relationships or business or whatnot, please do share it because I think this is so valuable. And I, I'm sure you know somebody close to you that needs to hear this or possibly pre-order your book or uh, learn more about you. And so where do people find you best on your socials? Yeah. So YouTube is definitely the first best place to find me, which is youtube.com forward slash Rebecca Zung ESQ. And then my Instagram is at Rebecca Zung. And obviously my website is RebeccaZung.com too. So okay. everything will be in the show notes, of course. Okay. So I want to ask you my closing question. So I asked this to all guests. Uh, if you were to share a piece of wisdom, a life lesson that you've learned along your journey that you just feel everybody needs to hear right now, it doesn't necessarily even have to be about this subject, but just anything that you feel somebody needs to hear that you learned that is a piece of wisdom you would like to share. Mm. I, you know, I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday and that is that people will think what you tell them to think. And, and that is, you know, with your value, you know, um, and I had this, you know, do I have time to like tell like a, a one minute story? Please. Um, yeah. So 
Uh, when I was, I had been practicing law for like eight years and then I went and was a wealth advisor with Morgan Stanley for like two years. I had my series seven and 66. And then I went back to practicing law. Somebody was leaving town and gave me her law practice. It was a small law practice. And I was, um, so nervous that people were going to think that I was a total flake. And so I told my business coach, I was like, people of Naples, Florida, it was just a very affluent town. I was like, people are going to think I'm a flake. She was a lawyer and I was just a wealth advisor and back to being a lawyer. And my business coach said, people will think what you tell them to think. They, They will think that you're a flake if that's the way you show up or you can tell them to think that you're the only family law attorney that has a financial background. So perhaps maybe you are more qualified than any other family law attorney. Which story would you like to tell? And within two years, I actually had the top family law practice in town and I was representing billionaires and celebrities and all kinds of people that clearly we're not going to be hiring a flake. And so I just, I love to tell this to people because people will think what you tell them to think. It is who shows up in the room. It is how you present yourself. It is how you show up in front of people. So people will think what you tell them to think. So powerful. That's so right on. And I think that's so key is really that whole thing. It's like if you spiral down this whole negative narrative, like, oh, people are going to think all these things. Of course, that's going to become a reality because that's going to be spinning in your head all the time. And you're going to have this illusion that that's all that they're thinking. So I love that. Such a great piece of wisdom. And I think that's, I think a lot of people need to implement that in their lives. Like, what are, what are you thinking about that you, like, what's this narrative that you're trying to um, really, or what you're manifesting into your life? Because really, truly, generally speaking, people aren't thinking exactly what you're thinking (laughs) and like all those negative thoughts. So that's amazing. I love it. Rebecca, such an honor to have you on the show. I so appreciate you and just thank you for, I'm just so happy that I get to know you more and spend some time with you and thank you for all you do. Like you said, you are impacting so many and this message I think is important. You're definitely the one to talk about it. Uh, So thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I just so appreciate you and I am so grateful for you. Thank you. 